Have you ever gone online to try and figure out how much money it actually costs to buy a house? If you haven't, we don't envy you. If you have, you probably ended up even more anxious and confused than when you started after reading conflicting information about down payment, closing costs, prepaid fees, home inspections, and all the other minutia that goes along with it. It can be super overwhelming to say the least. If I wasn't a real estate agent, I'd probably be right there with you, which is why I wanted to make this video to thoroughly break down all of the costs associated with buying a home so you can rest easy and know what you're getting into and how to prepare accordingly. So get out a pen and paper, fresh cup of coffee, and let's get into it. What's good everybody, my name is Parker Gray and I'm your friendly neighborhood real estate agent out in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Before I get started, please consider subscribing to the channel if you find this informative and tap the notification bell as well to be notified when I upload so you can continue to grow your real estate knowledge. So as I mentioned before, I am going to be discussing and breaking down all of the costs associated with buying a home, but I feel I've got to throw out a disclaimer here. This information should give you a good idea of what it will cost to buy a home, but the fees, customs, etc., are inevitably going to vary depending on your situation and geographical area. So if you're planning on buying a house soon, I'd recommend your next phone calls after watching this video be to a great real estate agent and loan officer in your area to get a more finite idea of a savings goal you should be targeting for your home purchase. All right, I hope that gave you enough time to get that fresh cup of coffee poured and your notepad ready, so let's dive in. I'm going to be breaking this down into three different sections just to make things easier to navigate and to reference. These sections will include one, your down payment, assuming like most you will be taking out a mortgage to purchase, two, the closing costs, prepaids, and miscellaneous fees associated with the mortgage loan, and three, examples of different cost scenarios across the spectrum when purchasing a house. I'll be explaining a lot of the nitty gritty details, which is intentional, as they are good for you to know. Believe me, if you're comparing lenders, you will want to understand what fees they are charging and why, so you don't get burned with exorbitant charges or get overwhelmed when they send you an itemized fee worksheet a mile long. And you'll want to know the benefits and drawbacks of different loan programs that affect how much you need to put down on your home. Speaking of which, let's start with the down payment. If you haven't done much research, you might assume that a 20% down payment is just the lay of the land when it comes to financing, but that is no longer the case. There are many different loan products and down payment percentages available that give you a large amount of flexibility in how much you actually need to save for a down payment. So let's go over some of the most popular options so you can see what might be available to you, along with a very basic overview of their benefits. The most common is going to be a conventional mortgage, which is going to have a minimum down payment of 5%, and most people end up putting down somewhere between 5 and 20%, which is the cutoff to avoid paying monthly mortgage insurance. Just a brief side note, since this is an important component of many loan programs. If you're unfamiliar with monthly mortgage insurance premiums, it is simply an additional fee that is paid on top of a monthly mortgage payment, which is implemented as a measure for a bank or government agency insuring a loan to offset the risk they are taking of someone defaulting on their mortgage, leaving them stuck with a loan that hasn't been paid back. Different loan programs have different names for this insurance premium, but the principle is the same regardless. At any rate, conventional loans tend to have the highest requirements to qualify, but usually offer more favorable closing costs and mortgage insurance terms relative to other loan products. The FHA loan is the next type of loan, and it is the most popular government loan program out there. It is insured by the Federal Housing Administration, which is where the FHA acronym comes from. It offers only a 3.5% minimum down payment and has lower qualification requirements than conventional loans, but on the flip side also tends to have higher closing costs and less favorable mortgage insurance terms as well. Next, we have the USDA loan, which is also known as a rural development loan. This is another government loan that is insured by the United States Department of Agriculture. This loan program has a minimum down payment of 0%. And yes, you heard that right, 0%. 
However, the catch with this program is that it is only applicable for properties deemed rural by the USDA, and you cannot exceed the income threshold designated for your area, as this program is strictly designed for low to moderate income home buyers. As far as qualifying requirements, it offers a lower barrier of entry similar to that of an FHA loan. The average costs associated with the loan are actually a bit cheaper as well compared to FHA, so this is an excellent option for people looking for a home in a rural area. Next you have the VA loan, another government loan product which is reserved for active duty and former military service members and surviving spouses in certain occasions. It is insured by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. This program also has a 0% minimum down payment, but without the income and location restrictions of the USDA program. It has low qualification requirements similar to other government programs, but the loan costs do tend to be the highest of the aforementioned programs. However, that is thwarted by the huge added bonus of there being no requirement for paying a monthly mortgage insurance premium like most other government programs. Finally, there is an offshoot of a regular conventional loan known as a conventional 97 loan, which only requires a 3% down payment. They call it a conventional 97 because a 3% down payment means the loan covers 97% of the purchase price of a home. This program is an excellent option for low down payment buyers with good credit and low debt since the qualifying requirements are much like a regular conventional loan. Not only that, but the minimum down payment actually beats the ever so popular FHA loan minimum of 3.5% as well. Also, you'll need to be a first time buyer to take advantage of the program, so keep that in mind as well. So as you can see, you're looking at anywhere from around zero to 20% for your down payment. So you'll obviously want to have a conversation with a loan officer to see what programs you can qualify for and what will be the best fit for you. And keep in mind that there are other less common loan programs that are just too much to pack into one video, and there are likely other state and or local programs in your area that I don't even know about. So as you can see, it's going to be very important to talk to a loan officer to talk about all your options, and it doesn't hurt to do a little of your own due diligence to do some research about loan options so you can be ahead of the game. Now let's get into the closing costs, prepaids, and other costs when buying a house. First, let's define closing costs and prepaids as they are often confused with each other. In a nutshell, closing costs are all the fees associated with the process of actually getting your loan, such as application fees, appraisal fees, credit report fees, etc. Prepaids, on the other hand, are ongoing expenses of homeownership paid partially in advance at closing such as homeowner's insurance, mortgage interest, property taxes, etc. Together, closing costs and prepaids run an average of 2 to 6% of the purchase price of a home, depending on the type of loan program, the mortgage company you're working with, etc. Note that prepaids are often included in what is referred to more broadly as closing costs, since they both are technically paid for at closing but you still need to know the difference in order to understand what they mean when going over these costs with your lender. If that's confusing, don't worry, I gotcha. To get a great understanding of closing costs and prepaids, as well as some of the other miscellaneous fees you may see when you close on a home, let's take a look at a sample of the loan estimate, which is an actual document required to be given to any consumer applying for a mortgage loan within three business days of a lender receiving a mortgage application. Before skipping down to info on closing costs and prepaids, know that this loan estimate is based on a prospective purchase price of $180,000 and the loan amount is $162,000, meaning there is an $18,000 down payment. Looking down at the estimated total closing costs for this loan, you can see that that amount is $8,054. If you were to pull out a calculator, you'd see that the total closing cost amount of $8,054 is about 4.5% of the purchase price of $180,000, following that 2-6% to average rule I just mentioned. Below it, you can see the cash to close, which is just an estimate of the total payment you'll be responsible for at closing, including your closing costs and your down payment, etc. Moving on down to page two, here you get an actual itemized breakdown of the various closing costs and prepaids themselves. 
Looking at section A of this sample, you can see the origination charges, which in this case includes a small charge for points, which is basically just a totally optional sliding fee that you can pay up front in exchange for the bank giving you a lower interest rate. Then you have the application fee of $300 for, you guessed it, applying for the loan, and an underwriting fee of $1,097. The underwriting department is responsible for reviewing all of your financial documents and then cross-referencing that information with the mortgage guidelines for your loan to make sure you actually meet all the requirements. It is a lengthy and tedious process and the cost of doing so is passed down to you as the borrower. If you look down now to sections B and C, you'll see the various third-party service charges that are paid as part of your closing costs. In section B, we can see the appraisal fee of $405, which is for an independent valuation of the home. The bank usually requires this so they can make sure that the house as the asset they are loaning money on is worth at least what you are willing to pay for it. Next, you can see the credit report fee for pulling your credit information and the flood determination fee for checking to see if your house is in a flood zone. Lastly, you'll see a tax monitoring fee, which is usually just a charge for an outside service to watch your account to make sure taxes are paid on time. Moving on to Section C, you'll see the closing fees of outside services that you are able to shop for. There is a pest inspection here for $135, though usually inspections are paid outside of closing. You also see a survey fee of $65, which is for having someone physically inspect and mark the boundaries of the property. More often than not, people don't pay for this when buying a house, but if you have plans of putting up a fence or building on the land, it's a good idea to make sure you don't end up encroaching on your neighbor's property. Then you have the miscellaneous fees for the title company, which is a party responsible for researching the history of the home to make sure that there are no unpaid debts secured against it, known as liens, or other issues with the history of the house changing hands that would affect your ownership rights. These title fees will almost always include the cost to provide your lender a title insurance policy, which serves to protect the lender in the event that the title company missed an issue that comes to the surface later on down the road after you take ownership. The title company may also charge you a fee for actually doing the research on the property to make sure you get a clean title at closing. You may also be charged a settlement fee from the title company, aka the closing fee. That's because in many places, the title company involved in a purchase is also the party to conduct the closing itself. Now looking at section D, this is just showing the total loan costs added together from A, B, and C for a total of $5,672 in this case. Moving down to section E, you can see the recording charge of $85, which is for having the title company deliver all of the appropriate documents to your county and or township where they must be kept on record. And you also see transfer taxes as well, which in this case is blank. Transfer taxes vary from state to state, and some don't even have a transfer tax, but in my state of Michigan, for example, when a property is transferred, there is a tax of $8.60 per $1,000 of the sales price, which is primarily used as revenue for local and state governments. The vast majority of cases, at least in my area, the seller is responsible for paying this fee, but it's a good idea to check and see with your real estate agent if that is true for yours. Then in section F, you have the prepaids like we discussed earlier. And I'd like to spend a little more time here on these items because these are really important. Here we have a $605 fee for six months of homeowner's insurance, which you will prepay at closing so that your homeowner's insurance policy is paid and in effect after you close. In my experience, it's more commonly prepaid for a full year, so just an FYI on that. Then you have the prepaid mortgage insurance, which in this case is blank. However, for certain government loan programs, you will have a fixed percentage of the initial loan amount that you will have to pay as an upfront mortgage insurance premium on top of the monthly mortgage insurance premium we discussed earlier. This upfront fee just adds to the default protection. Remember how I said most government programs are a bit more expensive upfront in terms of closing costs? This is one of the main reasons why. 
With FHA, for example, as of 2021, their upfront mortgage insurance premium is 1.75% of the base loan amount. So if this were a loan of say $100,000, you may see a mortgage insurance prepaid line item here for $1,750 or 1.75% 1 of the total. However, in many cases, you may have the option to actually finance that fee. So instead of paying it as a closing cost, you'd be able to just add it to your loan amount, saving you from paying the extra money up front at closing. Next, you have the prepaid interest, which is a little bit of a doozy, not gonna lie. So when you purchase a home, you won't actually be responsible for your first payment until after the first full calendar month has passed following the closing, since banks don't want to deal with partial payments. For example, if you close on April 15th, you won't actually pay your first mortgage payment until June 1st, since May is the first full month that will have passed since you close. And mortgage payments are made in arrears, meaning that you are paying for the previous month of ownership, not for the current month. In this case, that means the June 1st payment will cover May 1st through May 31st. So you're probably wondering, what about the payment for ownership between April 15th through the 30th then? Does that mean the bank is just nice enough to let people live there for free during that time? Well, while that would be super cool, that's definitely not the case. Enter prepaid interest. What actually happens is that you will pay the interest upfront for however many days are left in the month from the day that you close. If you look at the sample loan estimate, you can see that the prepaid interest for this loan would be $17.44 per day for 15 days, which is a total of $262. So this would indicate that the prospective closing date is somewhere in the middle of the month. Because of the way this is structured, some people try and close strategically depending on what their goal is, though it doesn't technically save money one way or another. For example, if you want to pay as little as possible at closing, you'll ideally close close to the end of April, meaning you'll only pay one or two days of prepaid interest and then have your first payment due on June 1st. If you instead close in the first week of May, you'll pay a lot more prepaid interest for the many more remaining days of the month, but you also won't have your first payment due until July 1st. So really, it just comes down on how you want to play that game. Next, you see the prepaid property taxes, which is blank and usually will be blank unless there is a property tax bill that is currently due and payable. Property taxes and tax prorations vary a lot from state to state and can be done in many different ways. So it's best to ask your real estate agent about how they are prorated if you really want to understand that. Moving into section G, we have the escrows. If you're unfamiliar with an escrow account, it is simply a neutral third-party bank account that is designed for holding funds temporarily in safekeeping. That being said, an escrow account plays a vital role in paying your bills primarily your property taxes and homeowner's insurance. If you put less than 20% down or are using a government loan program, you'll usually be required to have an escrow account for the purpose of paying those bills. Otherwise, you might have the option not to. The way it works is that your lender will collect 1 12th of the annual property tax and homeowner's insurance bills each month as part of your overall mortgage payment and that money is put into the escrow account where it sits and grows until those payments become due, at which point the lender will automatically pay your bills for you. By having an escrow account, it mitigates the bank's risk of those bills not being paid, since they aren't relying on you to come up with the entire lump sum when the bills become due. But what does that have to do with what you will owe at closing? Well, for property taxes, Perhaps your six month tax bill is going to be due after your first three full months after closing. That means only three months worth of your total six month tax payment would have been collected in that time, leaving the bank three months short of what is needed to pay your first tax bill. That shortage is made up for by, you guessed it, pre-funding that escrow account with however many months are necessary to bridge the gap depending on when you close. You will generally also have to pay for a few months extra in property taxes and insurance in your escrow account to serve as a buffer. That way, if you fall behind on your mortgage payment, the bank will have access to that buffer to still be able to pay the bills. In this example, for property taxes, you only have a two month property tax escrow estimate for $211. And remember, you're only paying for what you should owe. 
Whoever is closing the purchase will make sure that taxes are prorated correctly so you and the seller are only paying for the exact number of days of that year that either party will have had ownership. For homeowner's insurance, you're generally paying upfront for a year from the time that you close. So your monthly payment will adequately cover what is due next time the payment comes around, no matter when you close. But much like property taxes, you'll still likely see a few months of that buffer in case you fall behind on your monthly payments. In this instance, you have an estimate of two months homeowner's insurance for $202. Lastly, you see the blank mortgage insurance escrow. In my experience, it is very uncommon to have a required escrow for that, but you'll wanna check with your lender nonetheless. Lastly, in section H, you see the owner's title policy for $1,017. Remember how I discussed the title insurance for the lender? Well, that policy only protects the lender, so the owner's policy exists to protect you from the same things. This costs around $1,000 on average, but the actual amount will be based on the purchase price of a home. In most cases, this is actually something that the seller pays for, though that custom may be different for the buyer to pay it in your area. Hope I didn't put you to sleep just yet, but we finally made it to the end of figuring out these costs, and now we see the loan estimate just tallies them up to help you determine your estimated cash to close amount. So the other costs are summed up in section I for a total of $2,382. Section J combines all of the costs together for that total closing costs amount, again, of $8,054. Finally, the cash to close estimate adds everything together, including your down payment, to give you an estimate of your total cash to close on your loan. So for this sample, you have that $8,054 in total closing costs, $18,000 down payment, and a deduction of $10,000 for a total estimated cash to close of $16,054. If you're wondering where the $10,000 deduction came from, that is from the earnest money deposit. This deposit shows good faith from the buyer that they fully intend to purchase the home and abide by the contract terms. The amount of the deposit is specified in the purchase contract, held in an escrow account during the closing process, and then ultimately applies towards the total cash to close amount you owe in the end. You see it as a deduction here because that money will have long been deposited prior to you actually closing on the home. I really hope this has given you at least a solid fundamental understanding of many of these things, but I do understand that all of this stuff may be a bit overwhelming, especially if you're seeing it for the first time. And I'm sure it would be helpful just to get a big picture idea of what total home buying costs look like. So in this last section, I want to show you three different home buying cost scenarios so you can see the gamut of what your total closing costs may look like with different programs, down payments, etc. Let's say you're purchasing a $200,000 home. In the first example, let's assume you have a sizable amount of cash so you are financing with a conventional loan, putting 20% down or $40,000. Your total closing costs come to 3% of the purchase price, which would be $6,000. If you add the two together, you are looking at $46,000 total that will be due at closing. In the second example, you have a lower down payment and perhaps lower credit, so you are financing the same home with an FHA loan with 3.5% down, which would only be $6,000. Let's assume your total closing costs here are 4%, which would be $8,000. Adding the two, you'd be responsible for a much smaller amount of $14,000 due at closing. In the last example, let's say this is a rural home, so you are financing with a USDA loan, and you are putting 0% down, meaning you have no down payment at all. Let's assume your closing costs here are 4.5% of the purchase price or $9,000. In this case, say here you are able to negotiate with the seller up front and they agreed to contribute $9,000 towards your closing costs, thus eliminating $9,000 that you would have otherwise had to pay. And in this case, it wipes them out entirely. That means you wouldn't actually have to pay anything at all for the same $200,000 home at closing. So as you can see, there is a wide range of possibilities when it comes to how much it actually costs to purchase a home. I know I covered a ton of stuff in this video as well, so if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave me a comment and let me know. 
And of course, I put a lot of effort in putting this all together. So please let me know if you found this helpful by leaving a like on the video. If you want to follow my world of real estate on social media, I'd love for you to come on by and follow me. And you're always welcome to reach out on any of my platforms if you have any questions. And of course, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe on the way out. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Take care.